and then oh, wait a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to, to the first seminar back for this semester. Uh, before we begin, just a, a quick overview of the format of the seminar. Uh, there'll be around a 40 to 50 minute presentation, so please keep your mics muted during this time. And this talk is being recorded and live streamed to YouTube as well, just so you know. Uh, there'll be time for questions at the end and um, the remaining schedule for the for the seminars we've got booked in after this can be found on the link shown here and also all the recordings of things we've of the seminars so far are on our YouTube channel. So now I'll pass over to Alan Boyle who's going to introduce our speaker for the day and he'll also take questions at the end. Thank you very much Caitlin. Uh, well it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, welcome Hannah Hughes to the uh, seminar series. Uh, Hannah completed her first degree at Oxford uh, before doing a master's down at Camborne School of Mines and then go on to do a PhD at Cardiff. Uh, she spent a year at the uh, Wits University in South Africa as a postdoc and then got a lectureship at the uh, Camborne School of Mines, uh, returning to where she did her master's. Uh, her research interests uh, include the metal budget in the mantle, mineralization in the crust, ancient histories of the oldest portions of the Earth lithosphere and the generation of gases in igneous rocks with you know, implications for you know, dangerous things in mining, I think. Uh, Hannah's a committee chair of the Applied Mineralogy Group of the MINSOC of Great Britain and Ireland. And she's here today as a distinguished lecturer of the uh, MINSOC, and we'll be talking about PGE and chalcophile element processes from the mantle to mineral deposits. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So uh, I just allow that to share and hopefully you guys can see that OK. If I can have some nods from people who are on the camera, if you can see that OK. Super. OK, we'll assume that's all good to go. And hopefully there's no technological issues. Although apologies in advance if uh, our shaky Cornish internet doesn't, doesn't hold up from time to time. So thank you very much for the, for the invitation to come and speak to you today. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, and my only regret is that it's not in person. Alas, that's not possible. But one of these days, it would be great to come and, and see, see you guys in the department. I think I've been to Liverpool, um, uh, the university department once, um, but that was many years ago. And I'd love to come and have another visit another time. So maybe I'll catch up with you in person sometime soon. So in the MINSOC lecture um, that, that I'd like to give today, you can see the, the title on the slide, they're going platinum, platinum group elements or PGE and chalcophile elements from the mantle through to mineral deposits. Um, so apologies for the slightly cheesy title, going platinum was the only way I could think of making this ever so slightly catchy in some way, um, but in hindsight it's probably not a very good effort at all. Um, but anyway, you hopefully get the gist of what the, the, the talk is about, and that is about platinum group elements, about chalcophile elements, and particularly around how those elements are moved around in terms of their underlying fertility to explain or to try and understand the distribution of mineral deposits around uh, the Earth's crust. So there's a range of topics or sort of subtopics I'd like to talk about, and so they're in a rough order on this slide. So that's how do we make an ore deposit? What are the spatial patterns of mineralization? And what are the implications that that has on the security of supply of these sorts of elements, amongst many others in terms of with the thinking about critical raw materials? I then wanted to spend a bit of time thinking about the platinum group elements themselves, what we use them for, some of the economic drivers, um, in, basically in terms of their commodity prices. We tend to think of critical raw materials in the, in the sort of picture of rare earth elements, or lithium perhaps, maybe cobalt and nickel as well to some degree now. Um, but platinum group elements are also one of those critical raw materials. And because they are a group of elements, they have quite complicated economics and, and, and mineral processing tied up with them, like, like the rare earths. So hence I thought it'd be good to have a think about that for a bit. Then I thought we'd have a look at the sort of the main PGE reservoirs or sources. There's the main places that we can get PGE on earth and how do we move those PGE around via various geological processes, whether that be down in the mantle or up through into the crust. So particularly thinking about sulfides, but also thinking about platinum group minerals um, as the main sort of mineral hosts of these, of these elements of the PGE, 
And what that means in terms of, again, how we can move them around, how we can mobilize them from the mantle up through the crust, et cetera. And part of that is gonna to touch on things like liquid composition and, and the heterogeneity of, 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 of our sort of mantle or lithospheric mantle in terms of uh, the PGE distribution, what that means for crustal mineralization as well. Finally, I thought, well, I might end on some big questions. So big questions in terms of PGE geochemistry, the things that we don't really know all very well, and I think is probably the big question to try and answer in the next few years or maybe the coming decade, because it really will help us to understand how these things become mineralized and how they get moved around. So we've already used a buzzword in terms of critical raw materials. And you know, depending on who you are and what your background is, you might be sick of hearing the term critical raw materials. And for other people, it might be a relatively new term to them. So a critical raw material is basically some kind of commodity, some kind of resource material, earth material that we require <clears throat> for industrial or technological uh, applications. And particularly, it's something that has some kind of restriction on supply. That could be because it's geographically restricted in terms of where is economic to mine it from, and therefore certain countries have almost a monopoly on controlling um, how much of this metal or this material can be uh, produced and sold. It could also be um, that, that, that there's just a small amount of it, um, or, 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 and, and that in itself combined with various economic factors like the price or whatever actually drives it to being critical raw materials. But if you think about this if, from a very, I have to say, Western sense in terms of EGS reports, USGS reports, EU reports, etc. Typically, when we refer to critical raw materials, we're thinking about the elements that you see on the two right hand columns here, and particularly the elements that you see on the far right hand column of this diagram. So we're norm almost always thinking about metals, and we're normally thinking about metals that we produce in relatively small quantities. Arguably, you could make the case that a critical raw material for, say, yourselves and ourselves sitting in the UK is probably going to be different from what somebody in, um, I don't know, the DRC might actually deem to be a critical raw material, which you know could be a totally different product um, and material itself. So it really does depend to some degree where you are and what you're interested in. I'm going to be talking about it from the, from the context of BGS, USGS, and EU reports. And as I say, that tends to be reflected in the diagram that we see here. And this diagram is also quite useful in terms of giving a sense of scale for how much of these sorts of materials we actually produce on an annual basis. So PGMs, as they're listed there, which is interchangeably used as platinum group metals and can confusingly be muddled with platinum group minerals. And for the rest of this talk, I'll be using platinum group elements or PGE. So PGMs and PGE in this slide are equivalent. You can see the context there in terms of just the tiny, tiny production that we're really talking about here. And just for context, some stats say from 2017, we have around about 450 tons of um, PGE total that were produced for that entire year. And of that, about 180 of that was for platinum and about 200 tons of that was for palladium. And then the rest were for the other platinum group elements that I'll talk about a little bit later on. And you can also see that next to the rare earths there in that lighter green. So we're talking about, in the grand scheme of things, very, very small volumes, tonnages of material in terms of what we actually need, but yet we still class them as critical raw materials. And the reason being, as I've already said, is probably because we have a very small sort of um, number of countries or deposits rather that we can actually source these things from. So in the green uh, cells on this table, we've got various rare earth elements. People tend to think about that a bit more into the context of critical raw materials. And in the gray boxes, we've got the six platinum group elements listed there as well. Actually, we've got five of them, Ogmium is missing. Um, and we'll get onto that in just a second. And as you can see, with the exception of um, palladium, um, South Africa pretty much dominates the board in terms of, of where these elements are produced and, and the main mining country for them. Palladium is the exception in that case, um, largely controlled by uh, um, Norilsk, a, a big deposit in Russia. Um, there are other producers, including in Zimbabwe, there's some production in, in China, a little bit in Brazil, Canada, the US, but you can see there in terms of the percentages, it really, really is massively dominated by South Africa. And as I say, that is the main reason that we cluster 
critical raw materials. With all of that combined, and thinking also in the context of the last couple of years in terms of the impact that COVID has had on the mining industry, that is reflected in the prices for a lot of these commodities. And by no means are the PGE unique in that sense. You, know, you see commodity spikes in almost all metals, certainly as a result from the COVID um, pandemic and, and the impact that's had on the mining industry. But there are other factors at play if we're thinking about the PGE in this context that also drive price ranges here. So I just wanted to show you a couple of examples. Um, uh, we've not got all of the elements on here, but we have got platinum palladium on the top left there. Palladium is the red line, platinum is the blue line. And we've also got iridium, um, which is the orange line, and ruthenium, which is the purple line on the top right. And there's the gold price there for context as well. And this is basically the price since to the year 2000, so since January 2000. You can see these things wobble around. Typically, we tend to think about platinum as being the more expensive of these elements. Everybody talks about going platinum, including the cheesy title of this book. But actually, at the moment, it's palladium that is vastly more expensive than platinum um, of those two elements, at least. And so it, it is something to consider. Palladium is sitting at just under $2,000 an ounce at the moment and platinum is just under $1,000 per ounce. So there, there's a considerable difference there. But some of these other elements like iridium and ruthenium or IR and RU that you see on the right-hand side there have quite surprising prices and they are controlled by quite surprising factors as well. So iridium, for example, the price um, roughly speaking around about now is around $4,000 an ounce, which means pales, you know, puts platinum and palladium firmly in their place. And the reason is that iridium seems to be largely used in the production of certain pieces of 5G network. Um, so they actually use, I think, as crucibles or components of crucibles um, that actually then go into your 5G network. So all of this big push in terms of 5G being rolled out globally, whether it be here in the UK or somewhere else, has had this dramatic effect on the iridium price, which I find fascinating that it's spiked as much as it has. Ruthenium, okay, ruthenium would normally be at around about $50 per ounce, and at the moment is more, more around the $550 per ounce. And the reason being is it's used largely in thick film chip resistors. So it's used in the production of all sorts of electronics. And you may have heard of, also, uh, of the chip shortage. This is part of the problem amongst others. And again, this feeds into the drivers for the price. But all of that, again, pales into insignificance when we then factor in the price of this other platinum group element, rhodium, or RH in terms of its chemical symbol. And that's plotted in the green line on this diagram over the same time period. Platinum and palladium are still there in blue and red for scale. And as you can see, the price of rhodium um, at some point, I think it was mid last year, actually peaked at around about $28,000 an ounce. Um, it, at, at present, it's around about $16,000 per ounce, I think, just over. So ruthenium, or sorry, rhodium is largely used in catalytic converters, much like platinum and palladium's main uses at present. But rhodium is particularly good at bringing down the concentration or, uh, of nitrous oxide in exhaust fumes. And combined with various transport policies, including in China, amongst other places, and various changes in production as well, the rhodium price has largely been driven by catalytic converters again, by, by this desire to obviously bring down the amount of, of various nasty gases in our exhaust fumes. So in terms of the uses of PG, we've seen a couple of examples there in the context of the prices, but the big one that I think a lot of people think about for PG at present is the use in catalytic converters. As I've just said there in terms of certainly for rhodium, and that's a big thing that's driving its price, but also for platinum and palladium in the classic sense. And it's around about two to four grams that you use in any one catalytic converter for, a, for an average car. And the catalytic properties of PGE is also widely used for various industrial processes or, or, or the production of various industrial solvents uh, and solutions, and, uh, et cetera. But actually thinking about what the future uses of PGE might be and how that will affect their status as a critical raw material, and how it will affect their pricing and the economics behind them and their production is really important as well. So in terms of the main sort of future use for PGE, and again, some of you might have come across this, 
fuel cells are largely the thing that it that is thought that is reached to as a as a well we're going to need some PGE we're going to need them for fuel cells and it's approximately an ounce so call it 28 30 grams or something of platinum that is typically cited as being the amount that we would need for a fuel cell if we were thinking about a, a car again so if we, if we compare like with like so clearly that's considerably more than we have presently in a catalytic converter arguably there's you know there's a there's a debate to be had there about how much do we actually rely on hydrogen fuel cells on fuel cell based transport systems particularly when it comes to cars versus battery technology maybe this is a reason that battery technology and, and battery cars electric vehicles should be should be more widely used and we should move away from any possibility of having some kind of hydrogen fuel cell but then we also need to think that not all transport is alike so a car has a very different range and need um, than, for example, heavy haulage on the road, than, for example, trains, or indeed maritime shipping as well. And that's just thinking about it in terms of just the transport sector. So it's possible then, and it's probably quite likely, that in terms of our requirements for PGE, that they're going to continue to either hold steady or actually expand as we go forward into sort of industry 4.0 or a green future. I mean, particularly as we transition our, our transport systems over to something away from fossil fuel base. Aside from platinum, the other platinum group elements or PGE are also used in fuel cells. And I've listed some of those on the green box on the right hand side there as well. So there is this proton exchange membrane fuel cell, which is quite commonly used or a component quite in fuel cells is quite commonly used. And for that, rhodium, that really expensive one, unfortunately, and palladium are, are the, the, the elements of choice in there. We've also got protest, uh, proton exchange membranes in general that we might be using iridium and again platinum for. And it's estimated that between 30 and 60 percent of fuel cells are going to need that sort of membrane and therefore the PGE within them. But there's also some other aspects here as well. For example, iridium, ruthenium and rhodium being used for various artificial photosynthesis systems, again, to drive basically a water splitting reaction to make hydrogen. But again, it's another application there in terms of where we're using the catalytic properties of PGE. Um, and therefore, this could have considerable impact on their supply and their demand and therefore their price as well. So in thinking about critical raw materials and PGE, why have we got this security of supply issue? And this is probably something that everybody on this talk is going to be more than familiar with. We know that we have basically the legacy of over 4 billion years worth of planetary evolution, of just geology, geological history happening. And that's going to change the distribution of elements, of minerals. It's going to be driven by various tectonic climate or deep mantle processes, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's the culmination of all of that history that means that we end up with a very inequitable distribution of elements, of deposit types, um, of things that we can mostly extract, aside from economics, but things that we can actually extract perhaps in an environmentally sensitive way and in a, in a, a, a as sustainable way as possible, if sustainable is not a total oxymoron when we're talking about the mining industry. There's only one deposit in the, you know, and once we've used it, we've used it, it's not gonna replenish at least within our, our lifetime. And just for curiosity's sake, this is something that you know people have been thinking about for, for well over 100 years. And it, actually, I've got a screenshot there of a paper, one of the first papers, I think, really started to think about this. There's a very well-known phrase um, by particularly Cornish miners that say, or is where it is. This was the first paper written by the then editor of the um, journal Economic Geology, Alan Bateman who wrote a paper, why or is where it is. And ultimately this has led to sort of ideas around metallogenesis and, and the distribution of ore deposits through space and time. So if you fancy a, a slightly older read for the sake of sort of the history of literature, then do go and look that one up. And I have to thank Robin Shale for bringing that one to my attention. So as you see, that, that paper, why or is where it is, has ultimately fed into this concept of metallogenesis. And that's really describing the spatial, possibly also the temporal pattern of mineralization, in this instance of PGE mineralization. So the map on the screen at the moment is showing various deposits around the world that are mineralized in PGE. 
The yellow dots show deposits where PGE is more like a byproduct or co-product. It's not the primary metal or metal budget that we're after here, or group of metals. Instead, that would be nickel. So these yellow dots are showing us where we've got nickel sulfide deposits where PGE are, are present as well. And the red dots are showing us where we have perhaps some sulfides in there as well, but those are primarily PGE deposits. That's where we're, we're, we're targeting the PGE in those deposits. And the grade of the PGE is high enough for us to just want to extract and mine that, that deposit just for the PGE. And as you can see, the distribution there, you know, is far from spread out equally over the surface of the earth. There seems to be this correlation between the older portions of the earth's crust, so cratons and cratonic lithosphere, I suppose, more generally, um, and where we've got these deposits. And some of those cratons have also rifted apart. So for example, in the, the North Atlantic craton here, um, so between our little blob here, so I think that's probably the Isle of Rums, so a bit misleading to say we're gonna dig up the Isle of Rums. Of course we're not, and it's nowhere near economic, but nonetheless, it is mineralized and it is something that we can measure in grams per ton in some instances. So we've got the North Atlantic craton that's largely being rifted across the North Atlantic here and into the Canadian, uh, into Canada over here. And we can see that there's deposits that are associated with that craton, even though it's been rifted. We've got the Carval craton um, or the Kalahari craton more generally down in South Africa. And there's a huge abundance of those dots just down there. So the question is also, aside from the craton, is there some other geologic driver or coincidence that we tend to see in terms of where these deposits are. And that tends to be where we see large expanses of, um, of igneous rocks. So basically we've got large igneous provinces and therefore an association with mantle plumes, with extensive partial melting of the mantle through some kind of hotspot or something like that. So is this, is this pattern that we're seeing on the slide basically a bias preservation uh, issue? Is it just that we've got all those dots in the cratons and cratons are very stable, and so through time, we've just managed to preserve those deposits the best. And so we tend to know about them more. Or is their distribution telling us something fundamental about how the deposits are formed and the requirements that we need geologically to, to get these sorts of PGE becoming mineralized? So is there a chemical or physical uh, control here? So first off, before we dive into that too much, in terms of how much have we got of these elements and what's the grade in an ore deposit and therefore how much do we need to increase that concentration? How much, what's the concentration factor as it's expressed on the right-hand side of the column there? So, I mean, we've got platinum on the, or, or on the lowermost part of that table. You could basically read PGE as a whole into that one. We've also got things like iron and copper. And as we go down through this table, we're starting off with relatively abundant elements and ending up with relatively low concentration elements. And you can see that if we look at the concentration factor, the amount of upgrading that we need to do from just sort of background concentration to ore deposit, you know, we're, we're, we're really having to go some by the time we get down to the PGE. Iron, we just need to upgrade it by a factor of five and we're already in something that's potentially an economic territory. Whereas the PGE, we need to upgrade from our background concentration in the mantle that we're measuring parts per billion, we need to upgrade that at least a thousand times so that we can measure it in parts per million and parts per million is equivalent to grams per ton. So we need to do quite a lot of upgrading. How do we do that? Lots of people have thought about this in, and they've called it various different terms through, through, through the years. Um, the Australians have a different term for this. There's, there's various bits and bobs, ways you can divide this whole thing up. But basically, in simplistic terms, we can think of this as a recipe for mineralization. What are the main features we need, the main factors we need for mineralization? And they boil down to four things. One is we need a source of, in this instance, metals of, of PGE. And so we need the background concentration from somewhere on Earth to be as high as possible, basically. In the context of PGE, that's the Earth's mantle. They are slightly more concentrated in the Earth's mantle, albeit only a couple of ppb higher on average than they are in the crust. We also need some kind of agent. So we need some kind of uh, fluid or magma, um, something to carry these elements from A to B, from source to deposit. 
and we need a pathway for that agent to follow. So that could be some kind of big crustal lineament, or it could be a more discrete suite of faults. It could be something else, magmatic conduit, something like that. Ultimately, all of those combine and we get to a crustal level, hopefully a crustal level that's reasonably shallow. So it's actually of use to us as humans. We don't have to, we don't have to try and dig down to anything too deep. Otherwise, there's no point. It becomes sub-economic again. And we can have some localized concentration factors going on up in the crust, and that will form our deposit. So this is what we need to think about in terms of any deposit. And in terms of PGE, we tend to we, we can put these into a few more specific terms here as well. So we've got partial melting in the mantle as the source. We've got some kind of pathway that's magma. We tend to think of these things, or we know there's an association with large igneous provinces. We know we need lots of melting in the mantle. So we need some kind of magma to move these things around. And then we need to do something to the magma at a crustal level. And the main controls you can see listed there, fractional crystallization, magma mixing, contamination of that magma with some kind of crustal wall rock or, or whatever. And also there, there may be a strong control by fluids and vapors as well. So we tend to think of these deposits as orthomagmatics forming the same time as, as the host intrusion. But actually in many cases, it might be that it's it's, there's, a, there's a later hydrothermal or magmatic hydrothermal component that's important there. So if we look at one particular deposit type, and the classic for PGE is the Bushveld complex. Um, it's the big daddy of PGE mineralization. So this is the Bushveld complex that sits in the high veld of South Africa. And just to give you a bit of context, this is a deposit or this is an intrusion rather than Part of a much larger, large igneous province where there's all sorts of lavas. Um, we tend to think of these things as, as just intrusions, but there's a volcanic edifice with this as well. It's around about two billion years old. And in terms of aerial extent, the Bushveld complex itself, which you can see in that sort of purple outlines on this aerial photograph, is around about four and a half times the size of Wales. So this is an absolutely enormous intrusion, enormous complex. And of the Bushveld complex, a certain portion of that is mafic and ultramafic layered rocks, and that's called the Rustenburg layered suite. And even the Rustenburg layered suite on its own is, is something like three times the size of Wales, or to put it in Cornwall, 18 times the size of Cornwall, which I feel compelled to do sometimes. And it's nine kilometers thick. I mean, this thing is, is incredibly enormous. But ultimately, the mineralization that we're seeking, the, the, the stuff that is that is you know, of economic grade that we would call the deposit itself is a handful of reefs, if we're looking at the PGE here. I say a handful as if it's really dismissive, but actually they're the most important PGE reefs on the planet. And these reefs are typically maybe a meter, maybe two meters in some cases thick. In some areas, they can actually be slightly less than a meter. Um, and things like the Morensky Reef, they're, they're stratiform deposits. So they're things that follow the main igneous layering of, of, the, of the Rustenburg layer suites so and the mafic, ultramafic layers of this system. And within them, we've got the PGE mineralized, and they may be hosted within base metal sulfides, or they may be hosted in discrete platinum group minerals. And these are minerals where a platinum group element, whichever one it is, or it could be several of them, make up a stoichiometric part of that mineral. So they're really important in terms of defining that mineral. They're there in weight percent, tens of weight percent more often than not, but they tend to be very tiny and they may or may not be associated with sulfide. So we've got the PGE, but we've also, because we've got sulfides, got nickel sitting in those sulfides, we've got copper and iron. We may have cobalt in some cases, like the Morensky Reef, but particularly also like the UG2 Reef, which is another PGE reef of the Bushveld. They may be associated with chromatites, so a, a sort of almost monomineralic layer of chromite, and therefore they, we, we could be mining this stuff for chromium as well. So we've got all of these elements, all with very different price tags, all with very different requirements from a processing point of view, um, all co-mineralized. So this can make quite a, a rat's nest to try and unpick in terms of, of how do we extract this in a in a responsible way, how do we get the best bang for our buck, as it were? How do we actually get the most out of this rock in terms of our recovery of all the possible elements? So as it says there, when we're thinking about multi-commodity ore bodies of which platinum group element mineralization, just like rare earth element mineralization is a classic example where we've got at least six elements of PGE in this case that we're thinking about, 
it's not just about the grade. It's also about what it's co-mineralized with, if there are byproducts associated with that. And then even if there are penalty elements as well. So for example, some of the elements that might be associated with platinum group element mineralization are listed on the, on the slide there in terms of the chemical symbol. Arsenic and certainly mercury are gonna be classed as penalty elements because when we get to the stage of putting these through the smelter, they might think the smelter's actually got a reasonable concentration of these things coming out of the ore and they need to be scrubbed. So they, they need to be dealt with in some way. We can't just let them go off into the environment, into the atmosphere. And so there'll be penalty charges to the mining company, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to, we need to think about those as well. So all of this creates quite a tangled web from an economic and a mineral processing standpoint, and also from an exploration point of view as well. We need to think about mineralogy. What's the mineralogy of these things? Is it actually possible to process them? Or are we going to make, make substantial losses because it's just too difficult? Very briefly, I just want to read this so what we do to, to various intrusions when they're in the crust um, and, and how we actually get to the stage of having ore deposit. And we've already said we've got fractional crystallization, magma mixing, contamination, et cetera, as a, as a way of upgrading that concentration of PGE. So by basically increasing the concentration by at least a thousandfold from the concentration, we would naturally find these things in the mantle and probably also in magmatic and um, in magmatic rocks derived from the mantle as well. And so, you know, I'm sure you all know about fractional crystallization and the concept of magma mixing and contamination. We could be putting some wall rocks in here, we could be contaminating the local, the local sediments, for example. But the reason that these mechanisms are important is because they're all ways that we can trigger what's termed sulfide saturation. So this is where we manage to exolve an immiscible sulfide liquid from a silicate magma. We've reached a point where the concentration of sulfur in our silicate magma is just too much for it to handle. And so it's exolved this separate, this separate liquid. So think lava lamp. This is the system that we're, we've got in operation here. And because the platinum group elements are chalcophile, in other words, strictly speaking, I suppose they're copper loving, but really they're, they're, they're sulfur loving, if you, if, you, if you sort of think of things in terms of Goldschmidt's classification, if there is an immiscible sulfide liquid around, all the PGE, in theory, will want to partition into that sulfide liquid. And so this immiscible sulfide liquid becomes really, really important in various genetic models, various models, to describe how we end up doing a lot of that upgrading from the PPB level to something that we can measure in parts per million or grams per tonne, so something that's approaching economic. As I said before, there's more and more evidence to suggest that fluids, hydrothermal, magmatic hydrothermal, or even lower temperature hydrothermal, might have also a strong control on, on PG mineralization as well. And there are some classic localities like the Stillwater complex in the US, amongst many others, where the role of fluids of whatever description, particularly magmatic hydrothermal in that sense, has been pretty well documented. Um, and, and we know that that seems to have played an important role. Um, so we can almost envision a, a kind of chromatograph type system up through our layering, where actually the PGE horizon is controlled by the percolation of fluids up through that. But in other deposits and in other settings, the role of fluids has probably largely been overlooked or at least dismissed as a, as a relatively minor component if it's there. If anything, it's an inconvenience because it messes up our mineralogy, which again messes up our processing. But actually there's growing evidence, even in places like the Bushveld and recent publications, there's been several, but I pulled out the one there from Katie McFull a couple of years ago, that the high temperature fluids in these systems can further upgrade our PGE grade. Um, so they can further upgrade the concentration of PGE within various ore horizons or various mineralized, um, mineralized uh, sections of the intrusion. So they may actually be quite important. So watch this space uh, with regards to, to where that ultimately goes. So we've talked a lot about price, about uses, also about the sort of, I suppose, business end of, of mineralization in the crust. So that's where most of that upgrading is happening from PPB to grams per tonne. But we also need to think about the source composition as well, because if we start really low down, if we have not very much PGE at all in our source, and we could have a source somewhere else that has higher concentrations, 
then we've got to do even more upgrading before we get to something that is of potential economic interest in terms of our geology has to work harder. All of those processes has to work harder. So how, how can we understand how much PGE we have in the initial source and therefore what the fertility of a magma in this instance that's coming out of that source, what's the fertility of that magma? And in order to understand that, we need to think about things in the context of liquid composition. But there's a bit of a paradox here. When we, when we know we've got a deposit, we've, we've found a deposit, we know the bushfire is there, we know the Marensky Reef is where it is, et cetera. There may be lots of research questions around that, but we found that, we found various other deposits. Most of the time, we're looking at cumulate rocks. So we're looking at things that have undergone extensive fractional crystallization and or some kind of settling or sorting, depending on where you sit on these sorts of things in terms of how layered intrusions actually form. But there's already been lots of processes there. And we can't crush up a cumulate rock and expect to get a liquid composition from that. We could try and back calculate it, but there's a lot of assumptions that go into that. So we need to find some other way that we can get a liquid composition for a certain ore deposit or for a certain large igneous province. And this is where the volcanic pile or the volcanic edifice of these sorts of deposits comes in quite useful. So we could use lavas, for example. Alternatively, we could look for chilled margins or quenches, perhaps a sill system, and we could find something that's quenched. The point is we don't want to accumulate. We need to find something that's more representative of the liquid composition. And just to explain the diagram that's on the screen here, these are three different mines along the Marensky Reef in uh, South Africa. If I remember rightly, these are all, I think these are all Western limb. And we've got the lithology logged on the left-hand side here. And the squiggly line on the right is basically a histogram of PGE grade from bottom to top. And so on one mine site, you know, we see that there's a single peak in PGE grade. This is total PGE grade. You can see the distribution there. But on a very, in the grand scheme of things, very close by mine site, we have totally different distribution of PGE. We've got multiple peaks now. And actually, if we were to look at the individual PGE, we find that the PGE ratio shift around as well. So platinum might be dominant at the top and palladium dominant at the bottom or vice versa. So the mineralogy is really getting messed up here. And that's probably because of all of that cumulate process and, and any other remobilization as well, all of those crusty processes. If we were just to take that and try and understand the source based on that, we'd get this enormously skewed and probably very variable answer to our question, if at all an answer at, at, at all. So as I say, we need to look with liquid compositions. And the volcanic edifice of, of, of any large igneous province is, is very good hunting ground to go and try and understand the sort of underlying metal signature for that particular um, igneous province. And so extracting ourselves from the Bushveld complex for just a second, if we go and have a look at a more recent igneous province, so this is the North Atlantic uh, igneous province, um, basically we're looking at sort of 63-ish million years old or younger, then we can go and systematically sample a bunch of basalts from that area. If we've done our sort of detective work correctly and we're comparing apples with apples, we're making sure we're looking at basically the same types of basalt in each case. And we plot the PGE geochemistry, what we find is that the metal signature changes through time and space. So the earliest portions, so the outermost parts here, let's say in Western Greenland, and in uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland, in our sort of British Paleogene Igneous province, it has a platinum palladium ratio of about 1.9 to 2. So it's about chondrite. That means that platinum is, is present and almost double the concentration of palladium. If he looks back through time and take very, um, sorry, it's more recent times, and we take various other samples, we end up, for example, in modern day Iceland, then the, the platinum palladium ratio for modern day Iceland is flipped. Now we have almost well, over double the amount of palladium than we do platinum. So there's something weird going on in these metal baskets that we need to try and understand here. And this is where a recent project from a, a now graduated PhD student, Jordan Lindsay, comes in. And he's tried using things like machine learning algorithms, and various sort of data science approaches to try and cluster all the geochemistry that you can find, in this instance, in the North Atlantic Igneous province, and cluster that across every element he has in that suite of geochemistry. And he can express that 
there are a series of these sorts of plots that you see on the right hand side here. And without wanting to go into gory detail of the, of the, of the, um, uh, the data science approach here, this is basically reducing multiple dimensions down to just two on an XY plot and a color coordinated map. And the point is, if the color coordinated map looks similar between elements, that implies that those elements are in some way linked. So for example, magnesium and nickel, colorway map here, it looks very similar. We've got lighter patches down at the bottom, and we've got a darker blue at the top in instances for magnesium and for nickel. And we can play this game for all sorts of different elements. But if we do it for any of the PGE, we find that all of the PGE behave. There is in some way a correlation with one of the major or trace elements, except for platinum. And platinum just seems to do its own thing. It never, it just always seems to be behaving in a totally independent fashion. And so again, this is adding more backup to, well, there's something spooky going on with our metal basket. Why is this? Why does it change through time? What is the control on fertility? What's the control on metal basket? Bearing in mind these have quite different price tags as well. What's the control of that through space and time? And now we're really starting to ask, okay, well, how much metal is in the mantle? How do we understand how much PGE there is in the mantle, particularly in the, the more shallow parts of the mantle, either a cenospheric mantle or lithospheric mantle? And we can answer that two ways. Again, we can look for liquid composition. So that might be just using our, 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 our volcanics and our basaltic lavas in this instance, or maybe using some kind of meteorite compositions to calculate a sort of bulk earth or a bulk silica earth. Or we can actually go and look for pieces of the mantle and study things in situ in terms of their mineralogy and their chemistry. So that empirical approach in terms of taking mantle xenoliths, or this could be inclusions within diamonds, um, is another approach to trying to understand that distribution. And the problem with this, as you're about to see, is that we end up with a bewildering amount of detail, whereas our liquid compositions tend to give us you know, a relatively smooth profile. So in terms of understanding a source composition and therefore fertility for magmas, we, everything in an ore deposit model for PGE or anything actually orthognomatic deposit wise boils down to the sort of classic model as I've turned it there that you can see on the slide at the moment. And that is imagine a box model where we have a, a lertzolitic mant mantle composition. So we've got a very fertile peridotite composition in our mantle. We've got something that's CPX rich and in that, we've got OPX for olivine, we've got various other things as well. And of course, we've got a little bit of sulfide in there too. What we do is we start to melt or partially melt that box model. And as we do that, the most feasible or the easiest things to melt are going to melt first. So that's basically going to be clinoperoxine in this particular box model and sulfide. And once we've exhausted either of those, we'll start to melt some of the other uh, minerals in there as well. We might end up melting a bit of olivine too if we go really, really far into picrites or maybe even beyond into comatiites. But in this model, we're always assuming that the sulfides are accessible to melt. So in other words, that they're in interstitial positions within our little box model, or they're included within something like CPX that's going to melt anyway pretty easily. And the reality of it can be quite different if we start looking at those mantles analysts. What we find is that we can have sulfides that are included, maybe included in olivine, maybe they're included in something else. And also we find that the sulfides, depending on where they sit within the mantle, and I mean whether they're sitting interstitially or something included in an olivine or something else, they have very different geochemistry. And particularly they can have very different metal budgets in terms of the concentration of PGE. So we can get that if we start to build up lots of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And so if we look at some mantle materials just for a second, for example, here's a, a this is a CT scan of a, of a one carat diamond of a calcium arapa in Botswana. And the blue shell that you see is the diamond itself, but the red dots within it are little sulfide inclusions that have become entombed in that diamond. What we can do is basically extract those inclusions and measure the composition of them as well. So we can do that in terms of on a microprobe or something for major elements, but we can also use something like laser ablation, ICPMS, to measure the trace elements too. And if we do that on enough samples, for example, that might be a diamond that has been derived from a peridotite or a diamond that's been derived from an eclogite, both are being derived from, from the mantle somewhere, but the diamonds themselves are associated with different mantle lithologies. 
we start to build up a picture of different compositions in different places or associated with different mythologies. And in brief, what we find is that the total PGE composition, for example, of anything that's vaguely related to eclogites tends to be relatively low in comparison to its related to peridotite. Sulfone inclusions of diamonds are very pretty, lovely to work with, but they are basically a two mineral system. We've got a sulfide inclusion in a diamond, that's it. It's been in tomb. If we look at mantle xenoliths, we're looking at a much more complicated mineral assemblage. And arguably, you could describe that as an open system. In other words, it's got lots of grain boundaries where fluids, whatever type of fluid you can think of, can get in amongst and start to react with those, with those minerals and can start to remobilize and recrystallize some of those minerals as well. And so what you see on the screen at the moment here is a CT scan, which unfortunately I think has stopped playing. I don't know if I can get it to play again. Oh, I think it's frozen, Never mind. You see another CT scan of, um, this is a little five millimeter core from a mantle xenolith, and the white stuff in there is spinel, and the colored stuff that flashed up was a bunch of interconnected, mostly feldspar. And if we look for sulfides in those particular structures that are open, what we find is that those sulfides tend to have a very specific shape um, and distribution, and particularly chemistry as well. And so by mapping things out, either just using a thin like little cores that we can put through um, a micro CT scanner, and then extracting the sulfides or analyzing them in situ and looking at what their chemistry is in comparison to their position, we can immediately do sort of look at that original classic model and say, well, hang on a second, there's a few holes in this, and this might start to explain why we have differences in different um, in different metal baskets across a large igneous province or across the world. So I'm going to skip a couple of slides. I realize I'm running a little bit late. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to this last bit here. And that is, um, we've, we've thought a lot about um, PGE and sulfides in terms of in the last little bit there of, of fertility and, 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 and what that means in terms of fertility in a magma source. But one of the big things that we, we find very difficult, I think, as a community to try and quantify and understand is what the other mineralogical controls are, the platinum group elements. And that's particularly platinum group minerals, which I've already mentioned in the context of an actual ore deposit sitting in a crustal level somewhere. But we can also observe platinum group minerals within the mantle itself. And sometimes they might only be a micron or less than a micron. They could, they could be nanoparticles themselves. Sometimes it could be a bit bigger. And they're not always associated with sulfides. In fact, more often than not, they're not sitting next to a sulfide. And because these things are so small and they can have such a diverse range of compositions, you know, you've got tens, possibly um, dozens, you know, or more different species of platinum group mineral, it can be almost impossible to map them all. It's, it's just, we can't really do it. And if you can't map them all, we can't quantify how much the metal basket at the moment sits in these discrete little platinum group mineral phases. So if we base all of our fertility observations on this kind of classic model and on an assumption of sulfide specific behavior, how we partially melt out sulfides in the mantle, we might actually be missing a big old chunk of that metal, metal basket that's tied up in these teeny tiny little platinum group mineral phases. And so I think that's you know, one of the big questions in terms of what, how do we define that? How do we actually go about quantifying that? Because it may have other implications besides ore deposits as well. So in terms of a summary, um, we've seen that there's, there's different metal baskets, there's different domains in terms of the composition um, of, of PGE in the mantle, and they seem to be spatially and possibly also temporally controlled. And all of that will have an impact on the fertility of a magma for any large igneous province and therefore any deposit itself. So whilst most of the upgrading happens in the crust in terms of that, that thousand fold upgrading factor happening in the crust, we still need to understand sort of underlying fertility and as I say, the underlying metal baskets as well. And by doing that, we might actually be able to um, to look in, in more unusual places for where the PGE might be mineralized. At the moment, we, we put a lot of pay on, on those classic models that basically prescribe that we must have a mafic ultramafic system. 
But there's more and more evidence as we look at more and more of these sort of mantle lithologies that we can actually move PG around in quite exotic composition melts, carbonatites, lamprophires, amongst other things. If we're doing that, perhaps we've also got some cases where the PGE are actually mineralized within those. And there's a couple of notable examples. For example, the carbonatite intrusion, Palabora, which is the same age as, as the Bushveld, um, and also within South Africa, it's part of the, the Bushveld large igneous province, and the wonderfully named um, Mordor complex in Australia, which is a, a lamprophire, um, a lamprophyric um, intrusion, and that actually does have up to a couple of grams per ton PGE um, in it. PGE are really difficult to explore for because we have to rely on some kind of assumptions, our understanding of uh, igneous petrology, and then we have to back that up by paying for very ex expensive assays. You can't really see the mineralization per se in the field. You can't really use geophysics in order to, to, to identify many of these sorts of reefs. So it's really the geochemistry that it comes down to. And if we just stick loads of samples through geochemistry, it becomes very expensive and time consuming. So if we can try and understand these underlying principles a bit more, then as I say, it might open some doors for, for what's controlling it there. I'm going to finish my talk up there. If you're interested, there's some of the big questions that I think um, have been thrown up um, through the literature for decades now that I think we need to answer and that I've tried my best to summarise on this slide. So thank you very much for listening. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to chat. Thank you very much, Hannah. That was very interesting. Um, do we have any questions? Oops. I, I, I have a question, um, Alan. If, Go on, uh, Janine. Yeah, but I have lots of questions, to be honest. And it, was, <laughs> <laughs> it was a really fantastic talk. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so, Maybe maybe I'll, I'll ask a, a sort of broad question, which sort of relates to some of the things that you, you sort of posed at the start of your talk, which was sort of the, I guess, the global context and the, the sort of pressure on res scarce resources and um, this sort of energy transition. And I, I just wondered what your thoughts were on the, the role of like geoscientists in particular in helping to tackle some of those problems. Are there like particular skills that you think geoscientists have, which mean that they're sort of cru crucial to dealing with some of these issues? Yeah, I think, I mean, of, of course, I'm going to say that geoscientists are, are massively important in this whole thing. But I, I suppose lots of people who aren't geoscientists might put that down as a huge bias. But of course, they're important. We understand, or we, we at least try, even if we don't understand them, we try and put into a framework or a logical framework of what processes are happening when, through a, a huge time scale in comparison to what most other professions and, and people think about. So we're thinking about you know, billions of years quite often. Um, and we also are quite good at thinking about things in different scales. So we're quite adept at going from a sort of nano scale up to a kilometer or tens, hundreds of kilometer scale as well. So we, we, can, we can go across all sorts of different data sets and pull them all together. And I think that's really important. But I think one of the growing uh, uh, responsibilities for geoscientists and we particularly see this you know in sort of my role teaching people like mining geology and exploration geology is more often not, than not a geoscientist is a first person <laughs> in a particular place now that could be a place that you're exploring for a certain metal or something it could be far away from home for, for that individual but having that kind of presence and that community representation is really, really important. If you give off the wrong impression from day one, the project is going nowhere. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much money you chuck at it, it will be stopped one way or another. So it's really important that communication is there in terms of what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Why is it important? Is it responsible? Um, and all these sorts of things. I think that's something that, that um, I think a lot of people already know about, but, but more important people are finding as they then go off into their careers that is that communication that's key. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. I, th I thought you had lots of questions, Janine. Well, I do, <laughs> but I don't want to monopolise. <laughs> so you can come back to me in a bit. <laughs> I'll come back to you. <laughs> yeah. Do, does anybody want to displace Janine? Tudozi. Okay. 
Yes, um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, yeah, so my question is also similar to what she asked, you know, about the scarcity of these uh, PGEs. So I saw the map you showed about the cratons and um, I noticed that across some cratons, you know, on the continents, they also cut across the oceans. So I was trying to find out if your research or if you've also looked at some of the ocean drilling projects that may have checked some of these cratons that cut across the ocean. If these uh, PGEs could be found there, maybe it could increase their, their, the resource availability. Yeah, for sure. So I think that, that map is showing um, cratons that have been rifted apart. And so there's these sort of dotted lines across you know, huge swathes of the earth that join one fragment of a craton on one side of the ocean to the other side. When we see the deposits, we still see them in the cratonic remnants or the cratonic edges that have been that have been rifted. We don't see them in the middle bit, in, in, the, in the big rift in, in the middle, if you see what I mean. So we still need normally a certain age of rocks. Most of these deposits are proterozoic at least in age. There are a couple of really good ex exceptions to that, not least the Skergard intrusion, which is Paleogene. Um, in, in Greenland, but the vast majority are Proterozoic and Archean. And so ocean crust, generally speaking, is not going to be that age unless we've got some yeah, really yeah, miraculous ophiolite. And so most of the deposits we wouldn't expect to see there. But again, there's also another reason for that. And, and part of that is hinged on the kind of, as I say, genetic model for how these deposits form. And that is we need a fairly extreme degree of partial melting to exhaust those sulfides in the mantle source and therefore to get the maximum amount of PGE from the source into a magma. If we partially melt, you know, maybe 8%, 5 8%, maybe something around that sort of area, and we produce a general basalt, particularly something that looks like a mid-ocean ridge basalt, then we still see there's some background PGE in there that we can still measure it in parts per billion, but we haven't had, first off, we haven't had the maximum extracted out of the mantle that we possibly can in our melting environment, which is where hotspots and, and mantle plumes probably become quite important. And secondly, there's just not the room in the crust, in the oceanic crust, to do quite as much of these sorts of upgrading processes to get a large layered intrusion, for example, Within, within our oceanic crust. So it's those two factors in combination mean that I don't think anybody's really found a PGE deposit in something that is ocean crust. However, you can see platinum group minerals within mid-ocean basalts, and you can see them in ophiolites as well if you go and sample the basaltic portions of ophiolites. And in bulk chemistry, we can still measure platinum group elements, but they're going to be in, in very, very low concentrations. So a thousandfold or at least a hundredfold probably lower than the concentration that we need in an ore deposit. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Anyone else? I mean, I've got a general question, but I'm, I'm letting other people have a go. You got your hand up, Caitlin. Yeah, uh, thanks for a really interesting talk, Hannah. Uh, I was just wondering about the the sulfur X solution in the the silicate magmas. Does could that have an effect on the eruptive activity or the general path that the magma takes? Like I know you showed the like the lava lamp analogy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, alas, this is a huge topic, right? But it's it's well worth having a look in the literature if you're interested. So first off, yes, I think it could well have an effect in terms of, if not the eruptive activity, then the composition of the, the eruptive products that we're talking about. And there's been lots of work in terms of the metal content of volcanic gases by people like Marie Edmonds, amongst many others uh, down at Cambridge. And they can actually see PGE, gold, silver, various other precious metals and some of the semi-metals that they're associated with or they tend to partner up with like selenium and tellurium in the gas signatures from, from, from various uh, volcanic eruptions. And trying to link what that means in terms of once they're in that kind of the latalized phase, I suppose, in that gaseous form um, versus what's going on in the conduit system and, and the timing of sulfide emissibility and saturation and formation of sulfide liquid 
I think is one of those big questions again, is, is, is how do you relate those two things? In terms of um, more directly thinking about sort of at least liquid and solid volcanic products, um, not quite PGE deposits purely in their own right, but certainly orthogrammatic sulfide deposits, a classic example of where you see a sulfide liquid and a silicate magma um, in an eruptive sense is in komatiite deposits. So komatiite is a really important source for nickel as nickel sulfide. And we tend to see that we'll have a, a big sulfide lens that's quite dense in comparison to the silicate liquid. And that would have collected at the bottom of a lava uh, channel. It could be a, lava, a magma conduit. It could be some kind of, of levee type um, structure or, or something there. So certainly you can see the two liquids at surface as well. When we're talking about PGE, we're generally talking about a, a relatively small volume of sulfide liquid to silicate liquid. And we tend to be thinking about things that are in operation in mid uh, mid crustal levels, so not quite at volcanic edifice sort of level. Um, but still, as I say, relating what we see in that volcanics and, and in modern day gases right at the top to what's going on in the plumbing system underneath, I think is, is one of the big questions to try and figure out. Okay, thank you. I have a slightly more general question, Hannah, if I may, and uh, thank you for a very stimulating talk. Um, it, yeah. If one gives a lecture about PGE, like you've just done, it, it covers bushveld. And if one gives a lecture about gold, uh, you go next door to uh, cover the uh, waters around gold. And if you give a lecture about diamonds, well, you go, you stay next door, it'll shift a little bit and talk about Kimberley and so on. And, it, uh, you know, why, why do these three, you know, like, you know, possibly the biggest in the world for gold, diamonds and platinum, uh, formed by quite different mechanisms mm. uh, form in such close proximity to each other? <laughs> it's a good question, isn't it? I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, if can, can, can we find another South Africa? <laughs> well, I think that's the question, isn't it? Anyway, are they unique? Are they unique? So, you know, you mentioned the Vitvatisaran Basin. There is reasonable evidence to suggest that there's a portion of that that's sitting over in Australia, in Western Australia, and that there's a cratonic history in, in parallel um, uh, with the um, in the Pilbara or, or, or similar areas that, that have a, a similar age, and were linked at some stage at the right time for the, the age of mineralization. And we know have lots of gold in them. So is there you know, another Vitz basin yet to be discovered? Or is there at least a linkage there in terms of processes, even if there's not mm. another Vitz basin there? Did you see what I mean? Lots of people ask the same about the Bushveld. Is it actually unique? <laughs> we like to think of it as unique because we go, oh, look, there's this really freaky big thing over there that's, you know, got all this PG and whatnot in it. And we don't really see it anywhere else. But is it actually unique? Probably not. The, the processes that, that govern its mineralization seem to be in operation in lots of other deposits. And there's a circularity there as well, right? Like the, everybody studies the bushveld or lots of people study the bushveld and so that informs our interpretations and our kind of modeling and then we use that modeling in other locations even if that's not strictly the most appropriate thing for us to do so there's a circularity there as well you know the bushveld you could argue is a similar kind of scale to other large igneous provinces and most notably quote unquote super volcanoes that are more recent mm. um Again, maybe we're just looking at a different height than the crust. Maybe there's another one being formed right now. Who knows? Um, I don't know. But the, the sort of whole question of why are certain areas so well endowed in comparison to others, like the three examples you flag up, at least in Southern Africa or, or generally within the Kalahari Kraton, is again, there's, there's, there's lots of literature in terms of on metallogenesis and this idea of inheritance factors. So once you've got one area slightly more enriched in say gold in, in one example, then the geological processes that happen after that may only serve to continue to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade and maintain that background, that, that concentration of gold. And so you have this inheritance factor um, that you can associate with various types of metal deposit. That's one idea. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's intriguing, isn't it? Because you, know, you have the things like the sort of like the uh, late bombardment model to explain why we, yeah, because all, because mm. you know, all those platinum elements should be down in the core, shouldn't they? Yes, but well, I mean, <laughs> most of them are, right? So if we, if yeah, we yeah, yeah, most of them are, really and, and most of the gold. The core, yeah, so they, they, yeah, they shouldn't be near the surface either. So you have this late bombardment yeah. sort of model to explain why we've got these things. Uh, near the surface of the earth rather than down in their mm. sort of siderophile affinities. Um, but, you know, but does something like that sort of conjunction of uh, sort of lots of carbon, lots of gold, lots of platinum underneath South Africa, you know, is that, is that indicating some sort of heterogeneity of the chemistry of that bombardment? You know, that, you know, South Africa mm -hmm. struck lucky with, yeah, <laughs> a particularly fertile, lump of rock landing there it's possible and certainly people have proposed that in the past um, yeah. i think probably the most recent paper to say that this is a paper by wolf meyer amongst other people where again they were thinking about source regions it was pge related and there were source regions and source source uh, rocks for the bushveld parental magmas mm. and they sort of reached towards this um area of i think they they termed it unmixed uh, late bombardment enriched mantle. It was, they termed it something something like that. And that's the problem is, I mean, it, we can come up with these ideas. It's very difficult to demonstrate them other than to map, you know, using pieces of a jigsaw puzzle like mantle xenoliths, like diamond inclusions, and compare those to known deposits. And then if we keep doing that, keep building up pieces of that jigsaw puzzle to try and really assess whether something is, mm. there is this heterogeneous difference not only in the lithospheric mantle but deeper down in the acenosphere and, and could that be inherited from yeah like you say a kind of um, uh, uh, an in inequitable distribution from a, from late bombardment it's it's very difficult to try and prove it one way or another and, and those sorts of models like the one wolf proposed it's a nice story <laughs> but i think we have no way of knowing um for sure at the moment whether that's right or not thank you <laughs> Janine, round two. Yes, no, I just, we've got a question on um, YouTube. Oh. Um, I wondered whether you, you might um, be able to answer that. It's from Umar Farid, um, and they ask, apart from original mantle rich in PGEs, what other factors or processes during magma ascent plays a role in making an economic PGE deposit? So in terms of any magma ascent, it's probably going to be those four or uh, well, three or four boxes that I had on one of those earlier slides. So I mentioned fractional crystallization and magma mixing as well as contamination. And all of those are really important in the shallow crust and certainly localized around the deposit to make things become quite enriched in comparison to what they were before. But certainly in terms of uh, fractional crystallization and probably also magma mixing, that's all going to be happening during ascent as well. It's gonna be happening at multiple levels throughout, throughout from, from the source region and throughout various depths within the crust. I think we've moved beyond kind of having this sort of mythical magma chamber, you know, this blob in the middle of the crust that's full of, of, full of molten lava or molten magma, sorry, and then ultimately that becomes lava every week. So, you know, it's, it's not, we've not got those sorts of cartoon models anymore. Instead, we talk about magma reservoirs and we talk about crystal mushes and everything's quite, um, quite mixed, everything's quite heterogeneous, and we have a lot of these processes happening, as I say, throughout from bottom to top of this. Um, so uh, to go back to your um, original question, I would say probably fractional crystallization, which may or may not lead to sulfide saturation, magma mixing, which may or may not lead to sulfide saturation, all of these things would be happening throughout that system. If they happen too efficiently, too early, so for example, if we trigger sulfide saturation when we're still, you know, at the sort of uh, crust mantle boundary, for example, or, or, you know, at least deep crust, then great, maybe we've got a PGE deposit down there, but we'll never know. <laughs> and we'll never be able to access it. So in terms of from an economic point of view, whilst all of these processes might be happening, we need them to happen in a sweet spot in terms of in a, in a mid or shallow crustal level that we can actually get at and that we can actually identify and, and, and explore for. If that happens deeper down, there may be some geochemical or some other kind of proxy that we can say, oh, it looks like it, it, looks like it happened, but it, it's too deep. We're not gonna be able to actually find that mineralization at the end. Thank you. 
So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, the, the reason I sort of jumped in and asked that one from uh, YouTube, because it kind of related to something I was um, wondering uh, earlier, and it's about, I'm in my uh, research group, we're working much more on the sort of physical processes of magma ascent and smaller magma bodies, and we always have this sort of question about um, how, a, how the movement and the sort of propagation of, of dikes and sills then and relates to the sort of accumulation of magma in the larger magma reservoirs um, and and something that we focus on quite a lot and the sort of physical processes is a host rock deformation and sort of preconditioning of the the rock and things like that and yeah something I was wondering about in your talk is is how well integrated the the sort of petrological geochemical knowledge is with the, the physical um, sort of understanding about the systems. Do, they, do those communities talk to, talk to each other very much or? Nowhere near as much as they should do, but I think we see that across all sorts of areas of kind of, whether that be igneous petrology and, and, and uh, geochemistry and, and sort of, um, you know, volcanological geophysics of some description, those communities don't talk to, another, to one another enough, I think. There's some good precedents for it though. So for example, there was, um, there's been various copper based projects, particularly led out of places like Bristol, I think amongst many other, well, I'm sure there's many, many other collaborators involved. So um, probably there's somebody at Liverpool who's offended by my saying it was Bristol or something. But, um, but the point is that, you know, some of those research um, projects have brought together economic geology, classic igneous petrology and geochemistry geophysics and classic volcanology. And they've married all of that up across the whole lot to try and understand all of the features that are controlling co copper porphyry mineralization. Um, and so some of that's gonna be naturally quite academic in its, in its reach. And some of it's gonna be very, very applied. And ultimately companies are, are interested in all of it because it, it governs where, where these things can, can be there. But I think, no, to go back to your main point, we probably have to learn from, <laughs> from one another. And I think probably we need to learn from the geophysics geophysicists a lot more to try and understand what's physically possible versus perhaps some of these more wild models that come out um, based on some mineralogical observations uh, occasionally on a small scale. Great, thank you. <laughs> Alan, you're... Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm not sure your uh, sponsor would like that last sentence from you there, Hannah, but. Uh... <laughs> oh no, I'm sure they're open to collaboration. <laughs> so uh, do we have any more questions at all? I don't think so. Well, it just remains for me to say, thank you very much, Hannah. That was uh, really interesting. I should also say if there are any, uh, uh, students in the audience or on YouTube, um, uh, student membership of the Mineralogical Society is very good value, and I recommend that you uh, you apply to join. I will sign your form. Um, Janine will sign your form. Betty would sign it. Okay, very good value, <laughs> and uh, and you can interact with uh, people like Hannah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, everyone. Nice to see you all. Cheers. Yeah, bye-bye.